we've heard a lot about what I'm going to talk about, but um, w what I wanted to do is, as, as an investor, um, you know, I'm actually looking five to ten years out and thinking, you know, what's the new technology uh, across different sectors, or which are the sectors that are the most interesting for the future in terms of uh, benefiting from innovation and technology. And uh, when I put the fund together uh, two years ago, um, and also being based in New York, I'm a former investment banker. I was the founder of, uh, of a startup in, in the fintech space in 1997 in New York. I um, uh, really thought that fintech or financial services is really ripe for, for innovation. Uh, and so these are the trends that I'm looking at um, and, and the, the movement I've seen in the last two years in the sector. So why right now? I mean, what is it about this sector that, is, uh, that makes it ripe for, for disruption? Uh, you know, we saw a huge margin compression post-2008, and I'd say... You know, in the U.S., and I, you know, I'd argue it rippled through the rest of the world, uh, 2008 uh, is still being felt in terms of the, the new regulation uh, that ensued um, after uh, the, the crash and, and you know, the too-big-to-fail banks actually failing. Um, it, it just made uh, everyone worried about, about this sector that, and we, we talked about it earlier, that, you know, a bank you, you thought would signify trust, at least in, in uh, markets like the U.S., and all of a sudden that was turned upside down. Uh, and, and people, you know, began to not trust banks, and banks were less likely to lend the way they were lending, which um, uh, really started compressing their margins. So now they realize they need to look outside of their borders uh, or their four walls to, uh, to innovate, and they can't do it all internally. And, and so we're seeing a lot of banks uh, get involved in investing in startups. Uh, we're, we're seeing them start these uh, innovation labs. I, I think every major bank around, uh, around the world has, has started one. Um, and, and I think that's all really good news uh, for those of us who care about innovation in this sector. The second point is uh, millennials. Um, we hear it all the time. Uh, millennials are uh, a huge demographic all around the world. <laughs> and um, I mean, a lot of the markets that are going to see the most growth uh, are, are the youngest markets. So you look at Asia, Latin America, uh, Africa, these populations are all under 35. And, uh, and, and so there's going to be, and there is a sea change happening in, in terms of expectations uh, from banks and financial services. And I would argue that this is, we're never going to go back to the way uh, things were just because of this wave um, of, of, of youth who are digital natives and expect a different level of customer service and interaction uh, in, in every sector, and, and including financial services. The third is very tied to that. It's just the digitization of everything. I mean, we saw it in the music sector. We've seen it uh, in, in the media sector. A lot of these sectors were caught off guard. Uh, finance uh, can benefit from the experience of these other sectors that were very resistant to innovation um, and, and you know, I think have a better understanding of how they need to start acting and working with uh, startups and um, uh, smaller companies beyond their walls. And then the fourth point, which um, is very apparent to all of you, but um, it's, it's the, the growth of the unbanked consumer in emerging markets. Uh, we have two and a half billion unbanked people around the world, uh, a lot more billions of un underbanked, um, and I alluded to this before, you know, even in the U.S., which we consider uh, very well-banked, uh, I, I, I would argue that this younger generation and an older generation are severely underbanked because of the risk aversion that banks have had post-2008. So this opens up an opportunity for newer players, whether they're banks or, uh, you know, telecoms. We just we just talked about that. 
uh, to, to begin offering uh, services where the, the traditional banking industry have uh, left gaps. So, you know, as a VC, I follow the financings in the sector. And um, th this chart is actually missing some, some big financings. I just saw that there was um, a marketplace lender in China called Lu that uh, raised money last year at an $18.5 billion um, valuation, but they, ju they just announced it uh, this, this past week. But what we're seeing is um, a lot of activity um, in the last year, uh, we see a little dip in, in Q4. That's just because, uh, well, there's some seasonality to Q4 financing. And um, we're also seeing uh, just an overall slowdown in financing. But there's still significant amount of money uh, being uh, earmarked for this sector. And then this is looking at the activity going back to 2007. Uh, and, and the yellow is, is uh, VC financing in the United States. Uh, and you can see, though, that APAC, Europe, uh, other, have uh, also started uh, attracting more, more capital. And um, I think you know, what we're seeing is some of these business models in the US that are working are now um, being replicated in other regions and localized. Um, and I think that other piece or outside of the US piece is, is going to continue to grow and hopefully you guys uh, will all be a part of that. So breaking down where the money has gone by kind of subsector in, in uh, FinTech, you can see payments has gotten the bulk of, of the capital. Uh, personal finance management, uh, which are these robo-advisors um, and tools to help people save more. Um, it is the second largest category, lending. Uh, I was surprised, I thought more, uh, relatively more had gone into it because we've certainly heard about a lot of the bigger financings, um, but that's still been a sector. And then, and then Bitcoin is, um, is, is fourth, then I, I'd say, uh, you know, that's going to continue to grow. I'm obviously very bullish on, on uh, Bitcoin and blockchain, as, as you heard earlier. Um, but I think this also shows that there's still a lot of kind of subsectors that, uh, that will continue to grow in the future. So let's take apart some of these. Lending. Um, I just read um, uh, today that uh, Lending Club uh, announced their quarterly results, and they've now done over 16 billion of, of loans and, uh, and have really you know, proven out that there is a market for um, uh, creating marketplaces for, for lending. Um, you know, part of it has been driven by lower interest rate environment in, in the developed markets where um, you know, there are hedge funds and institutions that uh, want to make a bigger return on their capital than the you know, zero to 1% that currently uh, exists. And, and so they uh, have been going to these platforms to offer up capital for, for loans. This data is, is actually from the UK because I wanted to diversify a little bit. Um, and, and, and there, you can see that the P2P business lending um, is, is the largest chunk with consumer lending second. Uh, lending Club and their results today said that they're still um, major uh, uh, the majority of their loans are going to consumers, a lot of them who are refinancing credit card debt or, um, or looking to, to, to buy something small. And that's where we see the, the range of $1,000 to $35,000 uh, loans. Um, but I also think what we're going to see is some more creative financing models emerge, including invoice um, uh, trading, and we've seen um, a more of a verticalization. Um, you know, some folks, uh, some companies focused on uh, helping refinance uh, student loan debt. Uh, so, so I would encourage all of you to think kind of creatively about what the needs are in, in your specific market uh, and, and how, you know, marketplace platform uh, could address those. Payments. Um, I'd say there's a lot of innovation still in payments if you think creatively about it. Um, certainly we have 
uh, credit cards, we have uh, PayPal, um, we, we have Western Union, uh, but a lot of the innovation in the payment sector, you know, beyond the big players have been on the front end. So I'd say a lot of these remittance players make it easier, uh, a better uh, user interface uh, to access um, uh, services, and, and their fees may be slightly lower. I mean, it doesn't take much to get lower than Western Union that sometimes charges 12% um, plus in certain markets. Um, but what we're going to start to see is more back-end innovation and true peer-to-peer -peer, um, uh, kind of innovation in, in, in the payment side. I think the blockchain is going to be a big part of it or blockchain-like technology. Um, and, and that is, I'd say, an area to watch, even though lots of folks think that um, payments has been, been done already. Personal finance. Um, so this data talks uh, about how people in the US are um, using the digital mobile banking. Um, and, and right now in the US, a lot of it is still focused on checking balances, checking payment history. Um, you know, some folks are using it to deposit checks, and it all seems really simplistic compared to what's actually potentially possible. Um, and, and we've seen companies like Wealthfront, um, which has cut fees of, of managing money, and so what they do is, is um, automate uh, the, the portfolio, um, and, and so they cut down a fees to half a percent versus you know, 1% plus that wealth advisors may charge, and they've created um, what they say, they're, they're providing these wealth management services to a generation that otherwise can't afford them. And that's an area that is, um, you know, seeing a lot of activity in. Um, what's very interesting is Adam Bank and, and companies like that um, in, in, in the UK that are fully mobile uh, banks, so there are no branches, um, so they've cut down all of this overhead that the traditional financial institutions have um, and, and argue that they're going to offer, and they haven't launched yet, but they're going to offer uh, the same level or better level of services in a user interface um, in, in, in the way that people are used to. Now, if they did have to apply for and they got a banking license, so um, you know, that, that's still a regulatory hurdle that, that exists. And then Hello Digit, and there are many others like that that do savings tracking. Um, you know, we're going to, in, in one of the next few slides, I'm going to talk about this, or it may be the next slide, on, on data. And I think the key here is how all of these companies are uh, gathering data on their consumers to then be able to offer new products and services. So what they're doing today is not necessarily what they're going to do in the future, and that's what's really exciting about a lot of these fintech startups, because you know, once you have that consumer and you're gathering enough data and you've built that channel and that trust, even though there may be regulatory challenges um, or customer acquisition challenges, there's kind of a lot of potential down the road to be the bank of the future. There we go with the data. So the key here is data leads to personalization. And, and the, the survivors in this fintech space are going to be the ones that think about their data strategy from the get-go. Um, we, we heard from uh, Lendo earlier. So they were one of the first companies to think about using uh, uh, social networking data to assess credit risk. So, all these places around the world that uh, uh, there are no credit scores for, uh, but you know, they're perfectly capable of, of paying back loans. Um, uh, they started, they, they were really at the forefront of, of, uh, of thinking about using the data that exists out in the world and, and then bringing it back to that customer profile and you know, that identity piece that we're talking about. Uh, Policy Genius um, uh, is New York-based. Uh, they offer 
um, comparison shopping for uh, different types of insurance. But they're collecting a lot of data on what type of insurance I'm looking for, what car do I have, when do, what year is it from, what other insurance plans could work. Um, you know, do, does that mean that this person needs renter's insurance? And so it's this, uh, I say, more, more sophisticated way of uh, kind of offering, uh, you know, cross-selling, and, and, and the key here is getting to as real-time decision-making as possible. So, you know, somebody does not have to go through a painful, you know, two-month process to, uh, to have access to insurance or loans, and, and so, and, and data is, is the key to short-circuiting uh, that, that time frame. And the third point here is on uh, Internet of Things, IoT. Uh, it's still very, very early days for the IoT, but I believe that it's going to transform the way we think about payments. Because if you think about uh, every, every interaction that, say, a car would have with my music player that would have with my smartphone, with my personal robot at home, all of those are microtransactions. And if we start thinking about how, how can we kind of validate those, use that data to better service the person in the middle of all of those transactions, I think can be really powerful, and again, this is very, very early days. Uh, there's a lot of infrastructure that needs to happen before we get to you know, ubiquitous Internet of Things, but I think thinking about payments is going to be a, a big piece of that, uh, you know, of, of, of where and how quickly uh, we're going to be adopting um, a, you know, a true connected world with connected devices and people. And, and then uh, the, the graph is, is uh, pointing towards Cisco does this great study every year uh, predicting uh, the, the uh, growth of internet traffic. This is specifically on mobile data traffic. Um, and, and I think it's also closely tied to the internet of things um, because th these are going to be data pipes that um, you know, these devices uh, and people are going to be using. Uh, to do these microtransactions. So, um, you know, as, as we get more smartphones online, as we get more devices, uh, this is just going, the data is going to continue to, uh, to grow, and we'll also need really good analytics. Um, so that's the other uh, piece that I see a lot of financial firms focused on. Uh, Goldman just a couple days ago announced uh, that they led a series C, $20 million investment in um, a company called Zoom Data. And Zoom Data uh, it integrates data that's in different silos and uh, allows it to be um, uh, gathered and analyzed uh, in more of a real-time way. And, and that is very indicative of where a lot of these financial firms are thinking in terms of data and, and I think whoever figures out how to sift and analyze that data as quickly and accurately as possible are going to be the winners in um, even the financial technology landscape. So the blockchain, uh, we talked about this before. Um, I'd say the, the key points of it and then the reason it's so exciting, and I use banks as an example because we're talking about fintech, but you can replace banks with uh, notaries, um, doctors, and hospitals. Um, what, you, know, you, can, you can basically take any industry that has intermediaries, multiple intermediaries, and layers, and, and think about how the blockchain can truly disintermediate those. And, and the key points are that there's owner, ownership verification, time stamped, it's instantaneous. Now that's something that, um, you know, there's been a lot of conversation about. Um, a bunch of my portfolio companies and other really smart people are out there working on making the transactions as instantaneous as possible. I do believe we're going to get there. Um, you know, right now, it, it's kind of like the early days of the internet where 
you know, our, our data speeds were really slow um, and uh, we'd have to wait for a while for the, tra um, you know, the information to get to us. That's what's happening with blockchain or Bitcoin transactions. But again, I mean, I think this problem will, will be solved. Uh, we've talked about security of, of the actual blockchain in infrastructure. And then what's exciting is location agnostic. So we talked about, you know, sitting here and being able to send money to, to someone in, in Africa with all of these characteristics uh, at very low fees. And that is truly revolutionary. Now, combining that with all the data that can be created from this global ledger, and I think about, again, owning all of this, right? Uh, instead of giving up ownership of our information, our creative assets, our health records, our financial history, loyalty points. So all of this becomes currency that then we can trade freely in a global market. Now, it's going to take a while to get there. Um, but that, to me, is, is the real promise of this. And I think if you told a lot of people you know, back in 1995 that we'd be doing the things we are with the, with the Internet, uh, both good and bad, um, you know, I think there would have been a lot of question marks on whether that was going to happen, whether it was going to be possible, that we would actually have these... Uh, many computers in our pockets that farmers in Africa um, would be able to transact, um, you know, w in rural areas with Nairobi and build their businesses. I mean, just think about the economic potential that the internet has opened up, and I think the blockchain is potentially that, you know, on steroids, that, that there is going to be exponential potential, but we, we need a lot of smart people involved in, in thinking about all of these different applications. So in summary, these are, these are the areas that I'm looking at um, where I think, you know, the next five to ten years are going to be key in, in seeing where we go. Um, the analytics. Democratization, I, I talk about wealth management, but just in general, democratization of, of financial services. Um, and from non-bank lending uh, providers. And again, I think that will depend on regulatory environments. But when I talk to regulators, and I, I talk to a lot of them about blockchain because it's, it's a big educational process, there's a, there's a real willingness to learn about it. The cynics can say it's because they are, um, they're trying to figure out how they're going to overcome it and, and shut it down. But I, I think we've actually kind of moved beyond that point based on the conversations I'm having. And then thinking about down the road of this global marketplace and these peer-to-peer -peer transactions. And there's a company, uh, Venmo, that PayPal bought New York based, um, and they were one of the first to create peer-to-peer uh, uh, -peer payments. Uh, they use a banking back end, um, but they, um, I'd say, you know, they were a little early in the market, and, and, and a lot, most of their customers were these millennials coming of age, and, and those, that's the market uh, right now. And, um, and I'm, I think we're going to see a lot more of those, and we're going to see bigger companies uh, scale in that peer-to-peer -peer market. So thanks for sticking around. And if there are any questions, I have about five minutes to take them.